Today on Lightning Bugs. For you recording when you're just running through stuff, do you ever uh, do you ever just for uh, efficiency go to sample world or just oh, avoid it's, that? It's so easy to be to be lazy now, you know. And and there are staggering sounds, you know. There's I, I just got my hands on Spitfire, which is is this massive orchestral sample library. And you've got every possible articulation of every single orchestral instrument oh my sampled God. to perfection. Yeah. And you know, so it's like it's the, the difference between staccato and spiccato, or yeah. f- flotando and legato. You know, these things are just a tiny difference, but That's having right. that whole world, I mean, it's absolutely overwhelming and really, really vast. When ideas are coming out, I'm so curious to how you think about this of all people, but speed is kind of key. And, yeah. and normally, the, the faster I can enable an idea to come out, the the, the more the more it flows. Uh, and Absolutely. Ev- every kind of block to entry, whether it's, oh, actually, I haven't mic'd up the snare in the right way. Oh, I haven't done this, whatever. Mm-hmm. It, it, it stops the flow. And so, and so samples can be extremely um, kind of I- enabling in, in the sense that you can just go. You just go. Hi, if you're enjoying listening to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Lightning Bugs. Today, my guest is multi-instrumentalist and vocalist Jacob Collier. Uh, let's call him a mocal, multi-vocalist as well. He's got a lot of different voices. He started his career by uploading creative covers to YouTube back in 2013 at age 19. His cover of Stevie Wonder's Don't Worry About a Thing has 5 million views to date. Now, Jacob has four albums and five Grammy Awards under his belt. What happened with that other one? The third volume of his four album project, Jesse, the Jesse, was released in August 2020. Jacob is working on volume four and constantly collaborating with other artists. There's no other artist out there that's quite like Jacob Collier. Kids, listen and learn. Listen and learn to Jacob. How's it going, man? Oh wow, that was quite something, man. I'm yeah. uh, I'm I'm very honored to be here. It's so cool to, to to get to hang out. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm I'm like you. I'm like setting up. Uh, for you know, most people listen to podcasts. They don't you know watch them. But uh, if you're watching, you could see two dudes with a whole lot of shit in the background. <laughs> so you've true. got more than me. I've only been accumulating here. Uh, I've been in this space for. Three weeks. Oh, wow. And, oh, so within three weeks, you got wall hangings, you got mics, there's a kick drum I can see, electric guitar, floor tom, grand piano, two microphones at least. Actually, I can see four microphones in your room yeah. right now. Yeah. Why do we like stuff? Is that embarrassing what? to us? Like, why, uh, why do we like stuff? It's such a good question. It's it's hard to stop using it when, when you start using it. And, mm. and it's it's Moorish. Stuff is Moorish. It is. and But, you know, like they're... There's the very not stuff kind of creative artist that I look up to because I'm like, man, you know, like watching old uh, Bob Dylan uh, film with him trying to just tune the guitar and sit there and sing these amazing songs. I'm like, and I really need all this shit back here. Oh, yeah, I, I can relate to it. I can relate to it so much. I think I loved the sound of acoustic instruments and that was a problem. As, as far as accumulation of stuff was concerned. Um, I also didn't choose or identify with one instrument in particular, which right. I think you can probably relate to as well. So Absolutely. I always I always kind of found different dialects and diff- different things. Um, and as I was growing up, I just, I loved them all. And so gradually over the course of many years, I ended up with a few things. Yeah, and I like your choice of things too. I mean, um, when I look back there and see your your that's a, a Wurlitzer, that's like the kind that we had in schools when I was a kid. And, um, you know, they do a really good job of of imitating those now with samples and stuff. Um, how do you feel about that? Or is it just really more inspiring to you to hit the instrument itself? There's something about real keys that smell like fingers, you know, and, mm-hmm. and the weight of a tine being hit by something physical that that it just gives you different ideas. I think you can find ideas anywhere. And Keyscape, for example, just does like a staggering, splendiferous word it's a sample. But but it's just not the same as having the air around the sound, um, which yeah. is something that is you, you you just you can't recreate it unless you play the instrument. You know, for you recording when you're just running through stuff, do you ever uh, 
Do you ever just for uh, efficiency go to sample world or do you just oh, avoid it's, that? It's so easy to be to be lazy now, you know, and and there are staggering sounds. You know, there's I, I just got my hands on Spitfire, which is is this massive orchestral sample library. And mm. you've got every possible articulation of every single orchestral instrument oh my sampled God. to perfection. Yeah. And you know, so it's like it's the, the difference between staccato and spiccato or yeah. f- flotando and legato. You know, these things are just a tiny difference, but That's having right. that whole world, I mean, it's absolutely overwhelming and really, really vast. And and yeah, I mean, especially with drums, I think recently I've got I've gotten lazy with drums and I I, I will either use drums I've recorded before on other songs and just drag and drop them, or I'll pick up some random drum samples and, and figure that out. But I normally end up going to something real in the end. But yeah. I think what I've realized recently is when ideas are coming out, and I'm so curious to how you think about this of all people, but speed is kind of key. And, yeah. and normally, the, the faster I can enable an idea to come out, the, 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 more, the more it flows. Uh, and Absolutely. Ev- every kind of block to entry whether it's, oh, actually, I haven't mic'd up the snare in the right way. Oh, I haven't done this, whatever. Mm-hmm. It, it, it stops the flow. And so, and so samples can be extremely um, kind of I- enabling in, in the sense that you can just go. You just go. Well, and, and creativity, art in general, you almost can't have a conversation about it without recognizing that everything you say is going to be a contradiction 180 degrees. Because as soon as you say, well, you know, the samples don't feel creative, then you're like, but I can do them so fast, which exactly. means I can move really quickly. But I don't feel creative on this plastic thing, but uh, it's making me move quickly. And and um, I'm okay with either, like, I'm okay with either side. You know, like, if it's, I love the real thing, and I love that you can just fake it to live in your imagination, too. But that you've gone to the trouble to, like, have instruments that go out of tune, they rot like food, You've got snare drums and stuff up underneath your, like those are gonna, you know, resonate and make weird sounds in your room while you're trying to record. That's so true. It's so true. I, I can't quite show you on the camera because it doesn't. Does it <laughs> oh good? my uh, god! Look at all this. Oh, wait, can you? Can you see that? Yeah, a little are bit. Well, s- I saw. I saw a globe. You've got the world in there too. I've got the whole world. But basically, if I clap, if if, if you're if we're really quiet, this might work. I'm gonna turn up my gain. You got reverb in there. Did, did you hear that? Yeah, totally. It's because yeah. if I sing an A or a D or an E, then then 10 to 15 instruments go, oh, I'm in agreement. I and don't so, have that. Mine's pretty. Yeah. Well, that's just the piano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, pianos, pianos inherently already ring, but when you've got all these E major, A major instruments that just sing along with every... No, I, it's, there's something very, very comforting about it, um, which I, I like a lot. That's funny because we were playing a show recently with uh, orchestra and realized that our um, obstacle to getting the sound that we wanted out front was simply because the concert bass drum was resonating and, and it was his own voice. Oh, and no. it was it was masking like whatever whatever note it was on. I don't know, just something I don't think about that much. So... Um, as this is a, a, a podcast about creativity, I just want to keep framing everything in a way where you imagine being, you know, 16 years old again and wanting to uh, wanting to kind of get your head around how do you, how do you make a thing? Like right mm. down to the dumbest, the just the most boneheaded thoughts you might have. And my my first with you, I think, is pretty obvious, which is the concept of limitations, which those of us who have more obvious limitations than you do are quick to embrace that and say, man, you know, the limitation is what keeps me creative. And uh, and so I'm glad that I've got a three-note vocal range or I'm glad that I only know four chords and stuff. But when it comes to you, like you're an obvious, um, you're an obvious case of most of us don't even know what your limitations might be. Like, you know what they are, but they seem endless to many musicians. And we look at you and go, the fuck did he come from? Like, you do all this stuff. And if I'm going to embrace the idea that, you know, uh, limitations are awesome, then I kind of pity you. <laughs> yeah, well, you're, you're bang on. It's one of the biggest challenges of my entire creative life. Yeah. Um, because not being able to do something is more interesting than being able to do something. And mm-hmm. it gives you ideas more easily. 
because I find myself having ideas always perpetually on the edge of something I know or understand. And I've always had this since I was, you know, seven, right. eight, nine years old with my little Casio keyboard making samplers. You write was, onto something. Yes. Right. On the it edge was, of what you can do. Anything that you make that's good, it seems like it was just beyond your ability. Yeah, exactly. And I think I committed myself to the discovery and exploration of the edge the whole way through my life. And I'm, I'm still I'm still there. But now I think the edge is, is harder to find um, mm -hmm. in, cer in certain ways. Because I feel like once you have a base understanding of, you could even just say music in general, yeah, understanding how it works, how it fits together, knowing that there's a certain amount that no one will ever understand, it's completely mysterious. Yes. But the parts that, that one can understand, you know, I've I've explored in, in in some depth. And what's the edge at the moment? Like if you had to just say, Jacob's Edge, Jacob's the television edge. show. Wow. In terms of in terms of being creative, I would say there are there are different kinds of edges. Harmonically, I think. I think the edge is is microtones. Uh -huh. I think there's there's, <laughs> I've there's got a question un, about that. Yeah, un, unlimited unlimited key centers is something that people haven't really figured. It, it hasn't really figured in conversation since like the 1500s when instruments weren't built in 12 note equal temperament. Right. And and now I'm sort of on I've, I've on a, I'm on a bit of a quest to unearth these new these new keys and and there are ways to get there using sort of just intonation systems and all sorts of wacko. Uh, tuning ratios and, and basically just using your ear to to find the find a way to pivot on certain notes. It, 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 I can go extremely geeky and nerdy in this direction if you no, if you're interested. No, but it's I am such interested. A, it's an in... edge to me. It's a it's a yeah. fascinating frontier because I feel like people's awareness of music and experience listening to music is is very saturated by twelve basic frequencies and then mm -hmm. their corresponding octaves. And yeah. I mean it, they're twelve cracking notes. Like don't get me wrong. But no, that's at, at pretty same, yeah. At the same time, it's it's such a thrill to to remember that there's more. What about just taking other yeah. cultures and their and and their 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 take on their five uh their five frequencies or their seven frequencies? Uh is, is that something that's interesting to you? Oh totally. I mean if you, if you, for example, go to Indonesia and listen to Gamelan. I was going to bring up, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, Gamelan is, is so gnarly. And I, I can't pretend to understand what's going on, but mm. it's a really out version of the pentatonic scale that makes total sense to everybody who lives in Indonesia. And I think it's extraordinary because the relationships to the notes just aren't, I, I, don't, I don't know how to wrap my head around it. Well, they, I don't either. It almost sounds like, it, like, like, um, I remember when I was in music school, and and for for a uh, for a brief moment, I was a piano player. Mostly, I was a percussionist. And the reason the the moment was so brief for me was because they worked me to death. It's like you had to accompany everyone who was doing a recital. Basically, it's like having the Hippocratic Oath, where oboe player is going to have a recital and comes down the hall and says, "Oh." You need to accompany me next week, and suddenly I'm like looking at this 20th century music and trying oh, to play boy. it. Whoa! Half the time I would just look at the general shapes and the uh, the timing of it, and I would bullshit it, and they didn't know. Exactly. They didn't know that I was just sitting That's there going and just playing a bunch <laughs> of bullshit. I feel like that when I hear music in Indonesia, it sounds like they're falling down the steps uh, and like kind of making up pitches, even though it moves me and I'm fascinated by it. I'm not sure if they really know what. Do they know what they're doing? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think anyone knows what they're doing. Ever. Right. Right. But, there but you I, go. I do think that when people build physical structures that make sound, in some ways, the structures have to dictate a little bit of the music. So mm -hmm. here, for example, in England or in the U.S., we have like pianos and guitars and accordions and melodicas and yeah. mandolins that all have the same system of notes. Yeah. And, and if those instruments weren't there, then we would not know what we were doing even more wildly. Um, right. But, but for now, we, we just don't know what we're doing within the confines of a system. That's our limitations. Exactly. Here's my story. You know, um, I don't know. My dog died. You know, and, and can you tell that with 12 notes? Yeah, I could do yeah. that. Can you tell it with two notes? Yeah, sure, I could do yeah. that. Why do you want 17 notes and microtones <laughs> in there? Like, aside from the fact that it's an exercise for you, do you feel... Do you feel something out of those? Because I can't hear it myself. It's like not in my vocabulary. I I feel like I do, and just partly because I'm so I'm so used to those twelve keys. But it, you know you know how it feels when you go up you go up a semitone. You're playing the tune. Whoa, yeah. up a semitone. Hell yeah, that's crazy. Modulation. Yeah. Everyone's everyone in the room feels that. You think, Whoa, yeah, that's, it's an that's, applause maker. Yeah, yeah, it's so cool. Wow, uh, screaming, screaming crowds. 
So the, the, the sensation of the lift yeah. is, I think, is very universal. You know, it it's is, going yeah. up and everything goes up. The energy, the, the mood goes up. But, and also it's a different hue. It's a different color of the tune. You get, yeah. to, you get to experience the same relationships between the notes, the intervals, but yeah. just in a completely different place. You've it's like changed a, a new your altitude. Yeah, yeah, you're looking at yeah. life from, from, uh, from a higher spot almost. Yeah. Exa exactly, exactly. Yeah. So to me, I think that, I think a lot about like um, resolution of, of, of harmony, harmonic understanding. And you could say when you're a kid, your resolution is maybe triadic. Mm -hmm. And actually a lot of, say for example, African languages are triadic languages. Like if you go mm. to Nigeria, it's, you know, that's yeah, the, the yeah. way that it works is it's, it's three-tone stuff. And then you could say there's like the pentatonic resolution of understanding, which I, most people, even non-musicians, have a sense of the pentatonic scale and, and how it works and, and intuitively will find those notes, um, unless they're utterly tone deaf. And then like the next one up, you could say it's like major scales. You could mm -hmm. say, oh, I hear the whole major scale. And then the next one from there is chromatic. Chromatic, and, yeah. And if you if you had like a triadic resolution of understanding, if you were six years old and were just getting into music, then chromatic sounds, it would just sound weird. It would just sound totally foreign and probably mm. pretty unnecessary. You think, why, why do you have to have all these weird squiggly notes that don't fit in? Like, we could just have the notes to fit in. And yeah. that's a very, very reasonable kind of approach. But I think what happens when you, when you sort of progress in your understanding and you gather, yeah. then there comes a point where you want to get the next amount of resolution. And it doesn't make your music better. But I right. think for me, it, it gives me ideas faster because it's something I half understand. And when I half oh, understand something, then my brain there goes we go. bang, you know? There we go. I think that gets, that may, I understand that. That I can now understand. The, the idea that, that more vocabulary is needed doesn't satisfy me somehow. But the idea that for you, you're right. now living in enough unknown in order to progress. That totally that, makes sense. That's the thing. It's, it, you, you find the edge. You, you, have, you have to find the edge. Or I feel like I have to find the edge to get that chemical reaction to happen. And it's, it's like we're, we're a bit like scientists. It's like, where do you get that? Where, where does that spark come from? Where does that smoke arise from? Mm. And you have to just get yourself in a situation where you, you basically don't know what the hell is going on, but you also do know what the hell is going on because you have taste. And I if feel you have like those things, you're, you're cool. I, I mean, my pinhead's understanding of music history, musicology, music theory would be that um, you know you're talking about the six, the, uh, you know, a, a six year old and 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 a triad being being home and resolution. And I think, okay, well, look, diatonic, a diatonic scale, yeah, that allows me to change chords. I can have three of those and have different vistas which I'm looking at things from. And then it seems like, okay, well, later chromaticism came in because that allows you to, to, as Leonard Bernstein said, freewheel your way through tone, through key centers. Mm -hmm. So now suddenly you can justify why you went from one key to the other and you can go up and down. If that's a, if, if, if chromaticism is a key, uh, well, not a key, that's, that's, that sounds too much like a pun. If, if it's a vehicle to move around key centers, essentially, then what does what does between chromaticism lead you to well it, it in some ways it does a similar thing but it takes kind of it, it takes it takes some some courage and a lot of patience um mm -hmm. but for example this is just just to put it in context if you go up in a cathedral which i've done yeah. and it's so great i would highly recommend all the listeners to do that yeah what you, what you hear is is a, what's called the harmonic series, right? And so yeah. every note inherently has a series of overtones that, yeah. that get softer and softer and softer and closer and closer and closer together. And those overtones, when they're combined, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of them that go up. It, when those things are combined, they're called the formant. And the formant is what is what tells you what what te what the kind of texture of the sound is. So if a viola plays an A, you know, and then a vibraphone plays an A, then what yep. tells you that they're two different instruments is that there's, the overtones are different. But right. the first kind of 10 overtones are pretty easy to understand to the ear. And, and I, my theory is that this is why we love triads so very much, is because the first five overtones, it basically goes, if, I, if I'm in C, it goes like octave, fifth, fourth, third, mm -hmm. smaller third, even smaller third. And then it's like a second, and then a smaller second, and then a smaller... 
and, and the end it goes and then they get tiny tiny distances but as it gets tiny it beca- it, it's then between the chromatic scale yeah but but the okay. crazy thing is that even the fifth harmonic which is the major third in the harmonic series it, it's actually slightly flatter than it is on the piano because the piano is just a compromise basically that someone someone decided oh this is how we can make like affordable instruments and also music that plays in all keys equally um, is by is by saying okay well fifths and fourths are going to be pretty damn close to being in tune we like yeah. those, but but thirds kind of suck a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like an actual third is like, right? Yeah, but not according to the piano. But not according yeah. to the piano. So this yeah. is like such a big. This was a huge moment for me as a I don't know nineteen it's, or twenty year old. I was just it's a huge away. compromise. I know huge it's a compromise. huge compromise. Yeah, huge compromise. So so here's something I've been interested in recently that I'm still just very young and exploring. But say I play a C major chord. Mm. But I do my E, which is the third. I do that E fourteen hundredths of a half step flatter, which is actually in tune with physics. It's just right. like, that happens to be the number. So it's it's a basically a tiny bit flat. It's like slightly out of tune. But then that E becomes my new root note. And if the E becomes my new root note, then the G sharp of E is is a further fourteen <gasps> cents flat. Oh and so, shit! So that's yeah. that's actually minus twenty eight cents flat. <laughs> but then say that say that G sharp becomes the root, and then my C, which yeah. is the third. That's then now. That, that's what is it? That's now forty-two cents flat, which is basically half. It's like a, that's a quarter tone out. But so have you done that scene. in the cathedral? I've never done that in the cathedral. I think the cathedral might, might be quite unhappy with me. But, but, but basically, what this means is you can you can pivot on just what's called justly tuned notes, and you can access these key centers just through kind of sonority without doing any kind of crazy skullduggery. You can just say, you know, in the same way that it, in equal temperament. If I'm an if I'm an E major, mm. then I can pivot on this note, and then I can go to this key, D mm-hmm. flat major, because right. that note goes with both keys. So that's it's a great way of changing keys, pivoting, right? But but microtonally, I'm, and again, I don't I don't even know I I can't even imagine the the potential of this. But my sense is that it's pretty exciting because it it's just unlocks the the next the next kind of layer of, of tonal hues and things, if they're interesting, if they sound good. And that, I think, is the answer, too, because someone will, you know, if we don't, if, if the human race can make it, you know, through the next 150 years without killing ourselves, yeah, at some point, we will look back and I think probably find that you're on to something, that, 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 you know, chromaticism was the vehicle to just freewheeling around the key centers as we knew it. It's like, oh mm. man, shit. I can I can go anywhere. I I can write the dumbest Broadway song ever now and go anywhere <laughs> I want to go. But what you're on to is probably another keys to other stuff, but do you think that the audience has to be evolved or trained in order to understand that vocabulary? No. Nah, I don't a, believe so. You don't I don't believe, believe so. I love personally. that. I don't think so at all. I don't think audiences are trained to understand chromaticism, but right. they feel it. And right. so, so it's just about Love the painter that. that holds the brush. How do you want to paint with this? And 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 so I did. I I wrote a song in last year in 2020 called "All I Need," and it was on the last album that I released, Jesse Volume Three. And uh, the chorus comes twice in the song, and the first mm-hmm. time the chorus comes, it's in like E flat major. Mm-hmm. And then and then I. You know, then there's like a there's a middle section, and then it go, and then and then there's a like verse, and then it goes to a second chorus. And I just I did the second chorus in E flat major, and I thought, nah, it's just it's just not it's not elated enough. It's not it's not elevated. Mm-hmm. And so I tried it in E. You know, first thing I try in E, just yeah. one one semitone higher, and and uh, and that was just OTT. It's just it's kind of hackneyed. It's a bit crass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I did was I did E half flat, which was between E flat and E. And so the second chorus of this song goes to this. This other key, which does feel elevated because it is right. slightly, but it doesn't feel hackneyed because everyone's ears, I feel like a lot of people's ears know what it means to go up half steps. Like, yeah, yeah that's great, right. oh, great, predictable. But what this did was without you really noticing, I, I would assume most people, 98% of listeners, just wouldn't notice, and neither would they care, which is absolutely fine by me. Mm-hmm. But I think that when I listen to it, I get a sense that the second chorus just has that that special bright, thing that, that brightens it's up. brighter. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's brighter. Yeah. Then that's interesting because yeah the 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 half, and this is a th- like I I spoke to just a, a you know really really great music uh, and neurologist um, who 
uh, uh, psychoacoustics is her um, is is her field. And she said one thing that I didn't agree with, and I think that you and I are on the same page. A lot of their tests, which I, I kind of question, show that most people are, in essence, what we would maybe even call tone deaf. They're not they're not mm-hmm. recognizing pitch. They're not recognizing intervalic inter- intervals, intervalic relationship. They're not hearing those things. But my problem with that is just that basically, if you play someone a, a major chord, they're like, yeah, that's <laughs> great. I get I'm it. super happy. And then, oh, oh. <laughs> what happened? I know they feel that. So if, they're, if you've got a test to show me that they're not, their receptors are not understanding that that's a minor third in there, yeah. I wonder why is it making them feel sad? So if well, I was his, listening, yeah, yeah. He, here's well, here's two things that I would say to that because I love this. I love this conundrum. It's so interesting, and and I hope we never figure it out the answer because it's just so nice not to know. It, but <laughs> but one of my theories is that minor chords are it, minor chords are actually a, a reflection of major chords if you look at the structure of them. Okay. So C major is C G, and then it's major yes. third minor third, and a minor right. minor chord is actually minor third minor, minor third, third major third right. So if you flip this chord upside down o- about the axis of the C, you get F minor a, because... Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so you could say it's like the natural the natural resonance of every note is kind of a major chord because of the overtone series. The first five overtones makes a major chord. That's, that's what happens when any note happens ever in the whole universe. This is what you yeah. hear silently within it. If you flip that upside down... Then, then it's this. It's it's a, it's a minor it's a minor chord. And if you invert every relationship of the harmonic series, um, you get you get that. And so there's this crazy kind of polarity about the physics of of harmony that, mm-hmm. in my mind, and I don't know, maybe it's just like me having a fantasy. But I think it's uh, I think what you're hearing emotionally and feeling is is, both. is the opposite sensation of both, yeah. consonance by a minor chord it's it's oh but that's 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 the other that's the upside down consonance that that answers something for me in a way i haven't thought of it that way but you know an augmented chord is nothing but an augmented chord in that world it's always yeah. going to be like that but, yes, it but is. the two things that are going on are one it's the most stable thing in the world according <laughs> yeah. to your according to your, your your read on major and minor chords but it's the least stable thing for us to hear in 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 terms of just actual associative, you know, so harmony. So true. It's so true. And why would that be? That the most stable thing we've got. Look, any way you cook this shit up, it's that's that's what it is. It's right. just two two major yeah. two major uh, uh, intervals can't change that, and yet we hear that, and we're like, you just go and. Uh-huh. And what? Yeah, and yeah. you just keep floating off in the space. <laughs> yeah. You don't have this the unbearable lightness of being chord. Oh, right, right. And and if you glorify it slightly and you combine it with another augmented chord, you get the most mysterious and ever ever rising chord of all time, which is obviously the whole tone scale. Um, and and there know, you really have everything you need to score a movie. If you've got your augmented, that's and it. The, and the Lydian scale Lydian. will get you <laughs> all of the trailers. <laughs> I love that hacking it down. Yeah, um, yeah. I w- you could be I making one, a lot more money. A lot more money. The, the other thing, other thing I was going to say about being tone deaf, which I, I frankly agree with you. I I don't believe. I that don't it, believe it. Thing. If someone mm-hmm. was tone deaf, then they wouldn't be able to tell the difference between me talking like this to you, between me right. talking like this to you, because yes. one has tonality and one doesn't have any tonality at all. But the way that we were we were brought up is to recognize pitch and and the cadence of pitch. The cadence of pitch within yes. sentences is incredibly descriptive and meaningful to us as people. Mm-hmm. And so if I talk on one note like this, it's much harder to understand the nuance of my sentence because yes. I'm not making any tonal expression. And so everyone is has some sense of tonal understanding, whether or not they correlate that to musicianship and playing musical instruments and listening to songs. I think it's just completely inherent to humans to be expressive with pitch. And we are very melodic as, as creatures. Do you have Do you have a favorite? I don't have favorite anything. So, but do you have uh, Do you have a favorite interval? Ooh, um, well, I I like major sevenths and I like I like major seconds. Mm-hmm. I think you can make so many descriptive kind of colors just with these two intervals. Um, 
So that I, I kind of I kind of dodged the question because that's two intervals. I don't know if I have one favorite interval, but maybe I, I would probably say perfect fifth if I had to choose one. Yeah, because okay. the fifth is just I mean it's everything. It it's is the universe. It's, it's the column. Um, yeah, when uh, when uh, 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 you know MTT, have you ever worked with him, the conductor? No, I, no, I haven't actually. No. Uh, he's, he's brilliant. I mean, he's kind of our connection to to bring up uh, Bernstein again. He's our living connection. Well, him and Ozawa would be our living connections to to Bernstein. And uh, and I met him, and it was the first thing he said was, "What's your favorite interval?" I thought, <laughs> so what a, a weird icebreaker. thing. Yeah, what a weird thing for like a someone who's so brilliant to ask. And I was like, Jesus, I don't know. I, I should try I that on, on dates. Yeah, that that get, that gets you laid immediately, exactly. especially if Just you both agree. Down. You know, it's like if she's like, "Well, I don't know about." I, are you talking chromaticism? Because I really, really think that that's limiting for me. Then you're like, <laughs> "You found you found your soulmate." And I'm like, "This is this is this is my girl." <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. His was a um, his was a fourth. His was a fourth. I say fourths are so great. Fourth is just fifths upside down, though. So I would still go back to fifths. It's the same thing. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I don't know. I couldn't. I couldn't really. I couldn't come up with an answer for him. I didn't really know. I was like, I don't know. Can I? That's, pick a, that's a, whole... a very, very hard question. Uh, that's like, it's a hard question. Actually, the first time I ever met Herbie Hancock, he he was like, "Hey man, what interval do you like the best?" And this I, is the same two two brilliant he, guys asking the dumbest question in the yeah, world. Yeah, I, I thought, God, Herbie, I'm not sure. I, I said, "Well, what's yours?" He said, "Mine and ninth, man. I love it." I love minor ninth. I love minor ninth's invoicings, you know. And obviously, yeah. the minor ninth is this like the most dissonant interval, basically the most dissonant interval of all intervals. Um, yeah. But I also love minor ninths. And like, for example, we talked about the difference between this chord and this chord. Yeah. And one has one has the dissonance here in a tight knot, and the other has the dissonance here spread out over a minor ninth. This is like oh. a this is like a really austere tension, you could say, but this is like a like a, a knotted, more more cozy tension. And so Herbie and I sort of bonded over minor ninths. And so for that reason, I always sort of have a soft spot for them in, in, in my mind. Uh, of those two uh, iterations of the chord you were playing, what what what's the pitch that sticks out on either of them? Like 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 are you <laughs> mm. do you do you tend to hear the the top note of these things, or does your ear go for uh. some sort of relationship in the middle? Because most people are going to hear like one point of both of those. Right. That's right. what I heard on that one because yeah. that's the top note. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you could say the melody, but I think that through this one, like you hear that note more clearly than you do in this chord because this chord kind of wraps itself around itself and it, it sort of refocuses the 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 distance towards the middle. To me, I I pay attention to the middle of this chord. That's mm -hmm. what really speaks to me. That's where the that's where the kind of cream is. The voice is right in the middle. It's like that's where the head tension's being held. Whereas this feels like it's supporting the melody somehow. You know? Uh yeah, yeah. And and I, I think some of that's probably because the human voice is residing in the in the uh, in the range that, that your ears go. That's actually for. such a good point. That's such a yeah. good point. Yeah. What was the instrumentation? Because I'm sorry, I don't know the song. But the instrumentation in the song that you that you modulated to the key between E, e flat and E. Oh yeah. Well, how, how, one, did, how did you how did you do that in terms of your instrument? Was this all vocal? It was a lot of it was vocal, which is obviously great because yeah. you're free as a singer. Uh, there was also lots of drums, so the, uh -huh. the, the drums are going like <laughs> that was fine in both keys, and then the voices were going and doing some chords, and then there was the melody singing in the star bright underneath the moon. That was fine, so that transposed up, and then with all these synths, um, but. Luckily for me, in some ways, also it tragically in others, um, I've never got into analog synths that much. It just it's, mm. it's a rabbit hole I've I just haven't gone down yet. Yeah, um, let, let's let's, so, let's let's leave that. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> we'll just we'll just park that to one side for a second. Yeah. Uh, what that means is that a lot of my synths I could just type in the number oh minus fifty cents and or I think well, it would have been plus fifty cents and then and then we're we're. We're gravy. <laughs> I think it was. How, how it was did you find stuff from retro? How did you find the point that you did? Was it like almost a butt edit uh, um, uh, modulation, where you just suddenly everything goes up at once, or did you get there somehow? So, so there, are, there are kind of two ways I've done this in the past. Um, with this particular song, it was just like uh, suddenly we're going up. Everything suddenly in unison up. going up. It, Amazing. It kind of, 
the key changes already. So you're already, you already feel like, oh, whoa, new world. But it's just like, whoa, even newer world you know, uh, the second time. Okay. But um, I, did, I did an arrangement of, of Moon River. Um, and uh, in that arrangement, the whole last minute of the, of the piece, of the song, uh, it, it drifts up an entire semitone across one minute. Mm. And, but that's really gradual. And, and so that one was done much more like, <laughs> Just like hand, sort of handmade, like finessing it by by ear, um, following you just up. I, I put these locators in of of you know, do, and then do, and then do, and then do, and then do, and, oh. you know, and, and gradually, <laughs> gradually it keeps going. And I just made sure I was in tune with those things as as it goes on. So that's much more challenging and, and way cooler actually than just doing like everyone's going off in one go. But uh, both are, they're just both different. Are they mean different things. They, they mean just different mean things. different things. And have yeah. your have your musician. Uh, Friends, uh, have you noticed some of them catching on to this and then others just not noticing it? I would probably not notice it. I, my yeah, pitch isn't that good. Most people didn't, most people didn't notice. Uh, uh-huh. but, yeah. but there were, there were certain people. But that's people cool. That, but that's, that, that for, to me was a victory because if they noticed uh, yeah. that, then I, I haven't done my job, you know. Um, so, so having people just sort of feel elated at the chorus but not know why, that, that's, that's always the, the dream because if they know that's why, right. then... It, 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 the, the the bubble can, can be burst, you know. Well, when they know why, it's like when it, when when we're conditioned to it, like different. I, I you know my engineer and I have been working together for years, and anytime I put a modulation in something, every time we play it back while we're working on it, we both take a moment to go. <laughs> every time it goes by, <laughs> and it's it. sort of an it's sort of an insult to the way I did it because that it was that obvious, and it, it was like, oh, yeah, he went good. up. Slow clap modulation, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Slow clap modulation. That's a good name for an uh, for a, uh, for an album. Yeah, um, yeah. Back in the day, before you were um, before you were making records, uh, we always uh, we you know we recorded on tape, and between takes, I'm sure all the old folks tell you this. Between takes, not that you've never used tape, but between the takes, we had to wait because we had to rewind and even decide. You know, like so, you do three passes. Uh, it's about all you can fit on a reel. Uh. Uh, and um, once those three passes have happened, you have to decide if you're going to keep those three, any of those, if you're going to continue to record on that tape. And they rewind it. So there's all this quiet time in order to look back and think about it, which kids today don't grow up having. Mm-mm. I just had such a moment as I was as I was taking a, a, a leak there, and I was thinking, okay, I don't like... Um, I don't like to edit or, or or condescend or talk down to anyone. I think everyone can understand much more than we think. Mm. But I do want to point out that a lot of people listening to this are not going to even know, uh, not going to know the vocabulary at all. So I thought I would maybe get you just to give us a pinhead's version of what the what the uh, uh, what a tempered scale is. Great. Like, like you know, what the even-tempered system is, like, as succinctly, more succinctly than what I just said. I love it. Okay, here we go. I'm changing camera. Ah, uh, here we go. Oh, bring it in. So, this is the this is the piano keyboard. Yes. Uh, as was kind of established in about the 1600s, there are 12 individual notes on this keyboard, um, and then those 12 notes repeat. So you've got C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, F sharp, G, A flat, A, B flat, and B. Those are all the notes that exist because then That's you've got it. another C. Yep. So, so you've got a bunch of Cs. There's a C here, there's a C here, there's a C here. And if I transpose, it goes up forever. So, so there's many, many Cs. There's many, many C sharps. So what happens within the 12 note equally tempered system um, is that all these notes kind of have relationships to each other. And as you move around music as a sort of harmonist or a piano player or just jamming, you, you figure out how to get these notes to, to fit together. So when, when we say equally tempered, what it means is that every one of these distances is the same size. Yes. That's what it means. So, so all of these gaps are basically the, 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 same, the same distance apart in terms of relationships. And, and what that means is you can construct a whole world of music out of just these 12 notes um, without needing any more. And so mm-hmm. you, you could do such a thing with just the pentatonic scale. So the pentatonic scale is just these five notes. So 
It's, a, it's like a lovely sound that every note kind of goes with every other note. It's, it's really lovely. So, so if you just use these five notes, yeah, there's there's a certain kind of music that you could make. Um, but I think when you start adding other notes in, then suddenly music can get much more rich and much more complicated. So, so the twelve note equal tempo system, in in a nutshell, is um, a system whereby between this C and this C, there are 12 individual notes that are options that you can use or play with. Um, and the truth of the matter is, you can have a number of different equally tempered systems. There's one that's 31, that's kind of goes like... But in a very, very much more good <laughs> way. Um, there's one, uh, I think it's 53, is, is quite beloved. Um, there's even like seven and stuff. And all it means is you split this distance yeah. in, 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 into different numbers. Um, yeah. Does that does that work? I think that works. And 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 now the one the one uh, mystery bit there the the third as opposed to the fifth or the fourth mm. and the compromise involved in that. Yeah, okay, and how that, that affects someone like you who can hear uh, and utilize what is actually would be let's call it a perfect major third right. as opposed to a tempered major third. So here's the thing: in physics, every note has a series of overtones, and the overtones are tuned in such a way that it's not equally tempered because the distances between the notes are ever changing. And if it, it kind of does this, it does octave, fifth, fourth, mm -hmm. third, second, second, third, yep. and it goes up and up and up and up and up like that. Um, and, and what this means is that uh, when, when we take, say, the first five overtones of, every, of any note, it, it sounds a little bit like this, but the third is actually slightly different from the one on the piano. The one on the piano has been rounded to the nearest note. Right, because pianos are basically grid-based systems. It's it's like auto tune. It, it just yeah. it switches to a note that it's closest to. Um, in the same way that quantizing does with drumming, which means that yeah. if you go and you press quantize, it will go. Great, good analogy. So, yeah, yeah. So so essentially, all the notes are rounded to the nearest note to get this nice kind of keyboard. tidy system, yeah. which I would argue is very not not very expressive. But anyway. The, the situation is, with thirds, that the real beautiful, juicy, physics-based, what's called the justly tuned third, is slightly lower, it's flatter mm -hmm. than this one. It's, it's about there. Yeah. So I'm, bend, I'm bending the pitch. I'm bending it just a tiny bit down. If I sing what that sounds like, you might, some of you might hear the difference. So, so this is the piano third. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if I now sing the real third, beautiful, right? There's just a slight rub there, and yeah. that rub is is unfortunately what our ears have become accustomed to. Is thirds just being kind of distastefully sharp? I mean, it's not that mm -hmm. distastefully sharp. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we're really keyboard based now. Yeah, uh, we're really uh, uh, computer bound and really quantized based. So things that I love about about tempos shifting some and beats being back and ahead and the relationships of all that, we're in an era where we really wanted to find it and 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 round it down. But just as soon as you start playing with the brass section. Or you're, or or you're playing with, you know, uh, with with a great, uh, uh, with a great uh, small singing group. Yeah, you'll exactly. hear the, you'll hear them trying to bend those thirds mm -hmm. and, yeah. and and play with them. Everyone's got their own taste to it, but you hear that third bending flat with, you know, like, with, with with a brass group, and then they're playing with the piano, and then it's like, okay, it well, goes, yeah, <laughs> no, exactly, and then because it, it, your ear yeah. wants to, the your ear wants to do the thing that feels the best, and the thing that feels the best is what's natural. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I think it's totally inherent to play a natural third, but but it's a hoax, you know. And, and we were growing up with pianos, <laughs> and, and we, we think now that thirds are like this. But and this is a one valid third. It, it's not an it invalid is, yeah. third. It's no. just not. It just doesn't feel the same. And and actually, I, I've read in in a few places and heard people talk about this idea that you actually get if you get a group of singers or brass players as you're saying in a room and they play yeah. a real good triad, just a three-part major chord yeah. in tune, it does it does stuff to your body. Like it makes, it puts mm. endorphins in your mind. It, it gets you to- I believe that. It, you rattle, you you kind of vibrate in a, in a particular way, which which makes you happy. That the piano just isn't capable of doing it in quite the same it's way. It's just slightly 
Yeah, it's slightly unsatisfactory like slightly. that. But that's yeah. but that's my instrument, and it's where you know. But I have a different tune, you know, different tuner every night in different towns, and they they, you know, they're they're going with different you know with different methods, and sometimes the thirds do sound really fucking whack to me. Y- yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in Europe, they like to tune instruments like pianos really sharp, so they'll yeah. tune the A to four four two, which is like mm. versus like four four two, which is like. You know, so it's just slightly sharper, and and that can be just so jarring, especially for 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 me when I go to play gigs in Germany or whatever. And the yeah, I like just, it bright. Just slightly sharp. I mean, it's bright, yeah. but oh, yeah. I don't know, man. No, I'm I'm with you. I don't. I don't um, look, firstly, I don't respond nearly as much to those microtones as as you two. It's all. It's all the. It's to me. It's just the relationship, and uh, uh, on. That keyboard itself. If it was a quarter tone sharp, I guess I'd probably feel like I was having a stroke or something. Oh, you I, definitely I think, would, man. Hundred <laughs> percent. I think I'd know that. But just the but the but do you split it much more than that? And and I wouldn't hear it. But I do hear and feel the thirds, and it makes me play the piano differently. I find myself playing uh, a third that I don't like quieter. So I do a lot of thir- thirds with my thumb because my my left hand has a habit of doing. <laughs> that this piano's really out, but that's kind of normal for me. Uh, yeah, yeah, is, right. is is to play the, the the third above it, and I find that my thumb starts getting quieter and quieter on those thirds because it's it's it not making me good. happy. Oh man, that that's kind of crazy and makes a yeah. lot of sense. I will one, have one adjusted. Thing, yeah, yeah. One one thing I would say, I guess, is and this. I mean, I don't know what your experience was like in education, musical education, but. I think there's a lot of teachers and a lot of systems that say, hey, man, this is how it's done. Like, you do it this exact way. This is mm-hmm. the right way. This is the wrong way. If you do yeah. it the wrong way, then you're just bad at music. That's and right. there are so many people who go through that system and just get discouraged and, and stop being creative and stop trying stuff out because there's this idea that there's a right and a wrong in music. And they're just, frankly, in my opinion, there's just absolutely no such thing. I think you can make a, a strong decision or may, and maybe a weak decision. But, yeah. but ultimately, try everything, and there's no one way of doing it. So as we're talking about these thirds, I think I think it's important to sort of ascertain that, you know, it's choices. It's it's knowing that there's something that's possible outside the piano that's super killing, and people yeah. should dig. But it, that's not the right way of doing it. You know, it's not right. like if you do the piano, it's wrong, or or and maybe an even sharper or flatter or third. That also there's all sorts of thirds that sound cool and feel cool in different contexts. But I think the most important thing to to remember, at least for me putting myself back in my 16-year-old's shoes is just go ahead, man. Try it all out. Like just muck yes. about with music. You know, that I think you so. can try whatever you want. You can combine this genre with this genre. You can combine this note with this note, this chord with this chord. If you like it, it's probably good. And if you don't like it, maybe not. And then, you know, then we're back to the top about limitations. You know, the 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 things that we know become limitations because they become rules. You yeah. know, so so then and that's a contradiction again because yeah, exactly yeah you know like like we're, so we're back to the start of it almost everything that I can say about creativity emphatically becomes like the major third minor third uh, in in inversion it becomes the opposite <laughs> it becomes mm-hmm. the other thing that it's not you'll read it all you'll read it all differently. So true. Look, let's get the uh, let's get the question because now <laughs> we've gone over time. <laughs> we could, let's get we a question go, go, go. from from the uh, from the uh, listeners. Hey, Jacob and Ben, I think both of you are absolutely amazing composers. And as a songwriter, I've looked up to you both for years at this point. So I was just wondering if you could give us some insight on your creative process when you're composing music, especially for you, Jacob, because you're songwriting and there's just so many different instruments and everything. I just want, was wondering how you keep track of all of them. Anyways, thanks. Let me say, first of all, thank you. That's a great question and one that we've been trying to answer now <laughs> for, <laughs> for the, the last for the last hour and, uh, and, 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 and some time. Um, that's... It's so broad. Uh, do you, let's let's make it this way. How could you answer that in one sentence? How could I answer that in one sentence? You can take your um, time to answer it, but how could you answer that so super briefly? I would say I would say three things. I would say start with something you half understand mm-hmm. to get the spark going, and then I would say I would say let everything come out. Let everything mm-hmm. come out. 
don't hold back kind of what you just said actually don't don't hold back any ideas because you because they might not be good enough yeah or they might not be suitable let everything come out so so important and then and then the the, the final process is it, it's kind of what you just said it's it's find the center of it mm-hmm. find the north star of it find out what it means right yeah and and if you can articulate that to yourself in some way it could be a feeling could be a word then that will guide every decision from do I use a ukulele or a mandolin to do I turn the low end down half a dB to mm-hmm. do I scrap the second chorus? Is it shit? You know, to how do I do this live? To does this make the album? To do I need to collaborate? You know, all the big decisions. I, I think and you're to advocating for sort of, of you're advocating sort of for compartmentalizing these parts of the process so that you, you get do. to be an innocent child when you're creating and then you get to be an, an old jaded dude with a chainsaw. Uh, when it comes yeah, time to cut it down. I, I think there is there is definitely value in in dividing the process up because if you try and do everything at once, I mean, I've tried so many times, it just doesn't work that well. You know, you can't be the, the infinite child at the same time as the grumpy old man and both both you want it around your table in the process. But I think to me, just there, there are a few parts of the process. As I say, the first part is Get the spark that gets you started. And I think the secret to that is do something you half understand. Do yeah. something you, you don't know the answer to. Pose a question. Don't pose an answer. Pose a question to yourself. How? What is this? How do I get out of this? What's this container? Make a container. Break yourself out of the container. Get a spark. The second part of it is um, once the spark is there, see what comes out. It might be words, might be sounds, might be instruments, might be music. It might take two minutes. It might take 20 minutes. It might take 20 days. It might take two years. It, it just sometimes... Right. Sometimes when a spark is there, chasing it down can just be a huge long process. But but don't hold anything back. Let it come out to, to start with. Let it all come out. And then comes the process where you need to focus the beam. And and then that is about, you know, figuring out what it means. You can be yeah. as conscious as you like. You don't have to be conscious. But but I think saying, hey, this is about this person or this feels like it's about the way this year has been feeling. Or, yeah. or this is about nothing, man. I just nothing. That is yeah. all good, but once you have that, then then be really, really decisive and quick about about your decisions and and use your gut about what works and what doesn't work. And, and to me, I get tripped up when I agonize. Oh no, is it? Do I need the high snare or, or the low snare? You know, is it? Or I just don't know. If if I stop and think too hard, all of that spark can just drain away. It can fall away. Yeah. So I think it's about moving quickly and following your gut and and letting the song reveal itself to you. You know, it's it's like um. To me, a song is is already there. Right. It's within it's within the, the sculpture. You just have to remove the stuff that you don't that you don't need that, yeah. and to reveal what's what's already there. But in order to have any materials to work with at all, you have to say, let it all come out and not be afraid to just play. And I think those those uh, those times that you're talking about where you're trying to decide uh, which which snare, <laughs> something <laughs> terrible like that. Usually, my experience is an outer voice is kicked in. What will someone think of that? What will my inner, uh, uh, my engineer yeah, friends so think true. of that? So true. What, what will like? I don't know. Fuck. Maybe Kendrick Lamar hears this. He's gonna like be like that. Sound came from from you know my granddad's time. That's not cool. There's always <laughs> some, an always an external voice, and that's where I get tripped up. Yeah, it's, that's it's incredibly true. And so, so I guess maybe the answer to that is by, and it's hard. I mean, it's hard for everyone, especially. When you know when you're someone who, as a human, is is good at and enjoys empathy and and listening to other people and yeah. and doing a little bit of shape shifting and making room for people and and making people feel good, which is which totally is good me, manners. You know, yeah. if I it's, it's good manners, but but I think also I I can I've definitely had experiences this year more than any other year of my life actually where I've been plonked in situations either creatively or socially or whatever where I don't know how to hold my form without shifting to everybody everyone and change shape for everyone you know so like you know this person hears my song who's in their 70s this person hears my song who's in their 20s this song is a kid this person's a kid and they want to do whatever ideas songs expression live show whatever and i think i should oh i should shape shift. i should i should i should make space for it because yeah. there's, there's a joy about doing that but it's also yeah. incredibly dangerous and this year i think one of the challenges i've had is yeah, is what is the what is my form? You know, what's what's the form that I take when I'm not trying to please anybody? Um, and and I think 
that's a hard thing to do. Hey, one last thing. Uh, we, I wanted to get you to give us an exercise. Did it t- to talk to you about that? Yeah, I did hear about this, yeah. Okay, so this is called a New Week's Resolution. It's, it's an exercise that's achievable that we can all do for a week as you'll be the boss of us for this week. Do you, what comes to mind? So I'm not a human being who has a strict regime or routine in my life. But mm-hmm. one thing I'm a huge believer in is, is picking up a pencil or a pen and just writing. Mm-hmm. And writing whatever comes into your head. Mm-hmm. And so something that I've enjoyed doing quite recently that's, that's, uh, that's just been really cathartic and helpful and sometimes incredibly revealing and illuminating and also fun and funny is to set a timer. You can set it for however long you want. I quite like 12 minutes. Okay, let's go and with you 12. Have, You're the boss. You, you, you have a piece of paper, you have a pen or a pencil, whatever color you want. You start the timer and you are not allowed to stop writing until the timer goes off. You have to write, you just, you, the pen stays on the page. Yep. You write whatever comes out. It can be it can be what happened in that day or it can be a random memory of something that happened. It could be a story. It could be really, recipe. it could be a recipe. It could be lyrics. It could just be like anger in a pen, just like punching yep. the page. It could be drawing a picture. It could be a shape gotcha. or a, or a so, signpost or whatever. Once, 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 once I've done this for six days, do I do anything with it? No. So one of the most important things is that you're not allowed to read it back. And actually, what, a friend of mine, the friend of mine who, who gave me this exercise actually burns it after every session. Okay, he, let's do he that. Sets, he sets fire to the page. Let's not burn it. We'll get in it. trouble. Someone sets their house on fire. Yeah, they, someone's going someone's to set the smoke alarm off. But you, you could rip it up. You can put it in the bin. You could put it in water. And then so it's something where you cannot revisit, you cannot read it back, you cannot judge it. It's a completely safe kind of free output space. Um, and when I started doing this exercise, I figured... Oh, I wouldn't remember anything I wrote down because it was gone. Mm-hmm. But it's quite the contrary. The, the things that come up really stay with you and, and they've been surfaced. And it's a really lovely place to actually start your day from or write a song from or do whatever you want to do in, with your life from. Because you, you, you've, you exactly as you said before with the lyrics, you, you've got rid of your filter. You've said, describe all the things that you're not allowed to say out loud or you don't want to mm-hmm. say out loud or, or you feel like it's not fair or yeah, whatever. Karen, Just let it... Let it go. Yeah, tearing it up uh, is is safe that way. That way, anything that you say that is uh, that is horrible, mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. not right, disgusting, Dis- gross, d- distasteful, gross. No one has yeah. to know about it. Okay, I like. Yeah, that. you're not going to get someone picking it up and thinking, oh, oh, this looks this looks interesting. Ooh, ooh. Oh, let's see ooh. what Jacob. Oh, he's <laughs> a terrible person. I thought he was a nice guy. <laughs> exactly. All right. Exactly. All right. So, All right. so, 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 so there you go. Hi, if you're enjoying listening to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot. Thank you oh so much for watching Lightning Bugs on YouTube. Check out more episodes and subscribe if you have not already. You can also listen to Lightning Bugs wherever podcasts may be found.